this episode of Skeptico. A show about self-soothing. She needs to learn how to self-soothe. She needs to what? Self-soothe. Soothe herself. Let's just sing a song. We'll sing a song. Um, uh, uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, round and round, round and round, round all through the town. Uh, the, uh, I don't know. Can't. Maybe she's hungry. I'm going to feed her. Hi, come on. Let's go eat. Come on. I thought you were picking her. And how, if it was never really a good idea in child rearing, it probably isn't a good truth seeking slash personal development strategy either. Sean Carroll is writing books about the meaning of life. He's a complete materialist. Sam Harris is 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 a guru now, right? I mean, he's a pop culture sort of guru, but people come to him with answers about the meaning of life and what, what is it? If you're a physicalist, you can't really acknowledge morality you can't really acknowledge aesthetic quality you can't really acknowledge literature art you can't acknowledge the meaning of life i mean it's ruled out in advance i don't want to change my beliefs to whatever extent my life is livable it rests on the fact that i'm constantly seeking to be soothed to be comforted by that voice inside my head manipulated Mm -hmm. in a way that makes me feel okay and the last thing i want to do is take that leap and say there's something more that first clip was from the movie life as we know it and the second was from our guest dr richard grego who was nice enough to join me on this kind of trip through memory lane rebooted by some new stuff that's come out rich is a terrific guy and a great guest to the show really really smart appreciate what he brings to this conversation i hope you enjoy it okay dr rich grego is back Rich is professor of philosophy and cultural history, Florida State College, Jacksonville, and a really, really cool friend of the show. So Rich emailed me about a month ago, and what what, what ensued after that was, I think, a really cool conversation that we had that kind of morphed into this show. Maybe, Rich, you want to tell folks about... uh, this guy who you interviewed and then I subsequently interviewed on Skeptico. And then we'll tell him about this new book that he has out. Oh, okay, sure. I interviewed Alexander Maria Almeida, or, who's, a, who's a really uh, impressive, I, I, at least I find him a very impressive guy. Is what you really, you can tell me what you think, Alex, but for me, he's what you really are looking for in a great research scientist. Um, especially when it comes to a controversial issue um, that other other scientists tend to judge unfairly. Um, so, and 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 again, he he's been a near death researcher for a long time. As you said, I interviewed him for the for Skeptico actually at at, at a long time a while ago now at the American Psychological Association conference, I believe, in Orlando. He was doing a panel discussion with several other leading lights since including i think stanley kripner and another guy philosopher can't remember that's great so let me just interject to put an exclamation point on what you said so totally legit guy he's going to apa the biggest conference for psychologists he's a medical doctor and he happens in a very kind of open brazilian way where they're not kind of closed down to some of this crazy materialism he's like hey there's a lot of stuff going on in the world you know i mean we have john of god you know out here in our backyard we have other spiritual stuff going on so yeah. i need to go out and observe and report and as a doctor and as somebody who publishes in peer-reviewed papers like you're saying this is what i do baby i do science so you interviewed him it was really great and then he came out with another book i interviewed him really great and then tell me about this book that he has that you pinged me on in your email. Yeah, well, when I originally interviewed him at the conference, it was in regard to a book that he had done in conjunction with a number of other really interesting um people in that field called Frontiers of the Mind-Body Relationship, I believe. And that's what their panel was about. Um, however, I I just noticed. Um, because I happen to be reviewing a book for Springer Press for somebody else that he had a book out, a new, a relatively new, I think it came out last year called The Science of Life After Death, um, which is just what it's calling about. It's and, and it's very focused. It's a great book, very brief, under 100 pages, 
where he really summarizes the latest, a lot of the latest research, and more importantly, it's both its implications and the reasons why the scientific community still has not, <laughs> for whatever reason, uh, chosen to take it seriously. Well, so. buddy, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today, because, you know, you so you pinged me on that. And then I said, great, let's get him back on. Let's talk about this. And then the more we talked, we're like, you know, we don't really want to talk to him about this <laughs> because in a way it, it, now he's a fantastic guy and I love talking to him. But in a way it, it gets in the it misses the point. This is a check the box kind of book. Yeah. Of course consciousness survives death the yeah. the problem is the way that we've uh been trained to understand this very limited idea of consciousness and then how it plays out in these questions of survival so where i want to shift it and we'll shift it right away to maybe a video and i was looking you know who do we want to talk about this and then i i kind of thought what popped to mind is the Antichrist of neuroscience and afterlife, yeah. Dr. Sam Harris. Now, you, you know, the interesting thing about Sam Harris is that I point out to people is I have a video clip I'm going to play in just a minute, and it's a few years old, but it's great because it's really where he lives and it's where he lives to this day. But the, if you're just perusing the, the internet, you're, after, you're not going to find that. You actually you're going to find like this clip I'm playing here from Joe mm -hmm. Rogan. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to find clips like this one from the very excellent Lex Friedman, who is totally waffling on this issue too, totally misses the point. But, you know, he's going to ask him directly, Sam, what's the meaning of life? It up without any explanation. What is the meaning of life? And I'll, I'll spare you because he goes on 10 minutes and he doesn't answer it. Of course, he doesn't answer it. And the reason relates back to what we're going to talk about today versus Almeida's book, and this whole topic of survival of consciousness. And the best way I think for us to get there is for me to play a, a, another Sam Harris clip, the best Sam Harris clip. Let me play that. Science is not in, in principle committed to the idea that there's no afterlife or that the, the mind is identical to the brain right. or that materialism is true. Science is completely open to whatever in fact is true. And if it's true that the consciousness is being run like software on the brain and can, by virtue of ectoplasm or something else we don't understand, can be dissociated from the brain at death. That would be part of our growing scientific understanding of the world if we could discover it. Now, uh, and there's, there are ways we could in fact discover that if it were true. The problem is there are very good reasons to think it's not true. And we know this from now 150 years of neurology where you damage areas of the brain and faculties are lost, and they're clearly, it's not that everyone with brain damage is perf has their soul perfectly intact, they just can't get the words out. This is, the, you, everything about your mind can be damaged by damaging the brain. And what we're being asked to consider is that you damage one part of the brain and the mind, something about the mind and, and, and subjectivity is lost. You damage another and, and, and yet more is lost. And yet if you damage the whole thing at death, we can rise off the brain with all our faculties intact, recognizing grandma and speaking English. Okay, so that's great. And you got all that, right, Rich? That all came through? Sure. Okay, so the million things we can talk about. And this is kind of old school skeptical stuff, but we're going to bring it up to date because it's really, really, I think, current, particularly with what we've gone through in the last year in terms of what it means to surrender science to the quote unquote authorities, to the expert, mm -hmm. to the we are science. We'll tell you what science is. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I'd point out, and I, I want you to comment on this because in particular, Rich, what's great about talking to you is you have this strong philosophy background and you think like a philosopher, but you also think like a scientist. We would expect the same from Dr. Sam Harris. And let's, by the way, not forget that his brand is atheist. That is his brand, right? So he's, he, you got to remember, he's not going to switch his position because he's built this kind of brand. And his other brand is neuroscience. He's a neuroscientist, right? So those are the two things. But right off the bat, what does he do with science? What does he say about science? One, he misses the basic skeptical 101. 
Science is a method. It's not a position statement. What does he say at the beginning? Science says this. Science is this. I am science. Yeah. Do you want to just even build off of that, comment on that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, I tend to, you know, I'm a cultural historian too. I just tend to look at that view of science now and maybe the institutionalization of it like that as similar to the, you know, the church and scholasticism in the 50, 500 years ago. Um, it's it's sort of the, the you know, where they, and, and it's easy for us to look at it that way because we can all look back 500 years and be critical of the of the Catholic Church in the 1500s um, and scholastic philosophy and the scholastic worldview as being um, reductive and and um, and controlling and domineering and uh, authoritarian and monolithic. And I think that's Sam Harris represents that trend now. in I think in science today, scientism being the scholasticism of the modern era. Um, so you have a, an institution that that now is desperate to control in a very reductive way, this really reductive narrative about what real all reality is and what you're allowed to admit what you're allowed to say or not say or what will allow what you're allowed to investigate for that matter. But well, I, I think we also got to point out that he does it in a very uh, subtle way here. And again, this is a few years old and his new shtick is even more smooth and has mm -hmm. these, you know, very meditative kind of yeah. things. But sure. but he's sliding off. Of, I really want to drill into the science thing, because number one, he says science doesn't say this science. Yeah. And he equates science with materialism. He yeah. doesn't he doesn't even introduce the basics of science is what we're going to go out and observe. We are yeah. going to observe the world. He seems to be completely bypassing what we yeah. were talking about in the book with Almeida, which is anyone can go out and say, gee, we've observed a lot of cases where consciousness seems to survive death. Is he yeah. referencing any of those? Is he referencing yeah. near-death experience, after-death communication, medium communication? Is he referencing any out-of-body experience, reincarnation? These are all observed phenomena that we can acknowledge at least because people are doing research on him and publishing right. peer-reviewed papers on him. Yeah. We could say there are all these observations out there that we need to somehow wrap our arms around and figure out. He's he's not doing any of that. Go back and listen carefully to what he said. And this is philosophy, right? Because what he is doing is taking a philosophical approach. He's not talking about observed evidence or experimentation, falsification. He's saying, I'm going to make an inference here about if, you know, yeah. the brain is damaged, your memory's damaged. Therefore, if the whole brain is damaged, then there couldn't possibly, it's like, oh, well, what about, what about the data? What about yeah. the data over here? Any right. thoughts on that? Yeah. Which is supposed to be what science is all about. Right. I mean, and, and, and in fact, the, it seems to me, especially in terms of near death experience, the majority of scientists who actually go out and do what you're prescribing find, you know, we, their conclusions are exactly the opposite of Sam Harris's, as well as ever, as well as most of the other sort of, con I don't know what NDE debunkers, if, if that's the right word, I don't know. Um, but and and you being fr as familiar with the literature as you are, in fact, probably much more than than obviously much more than a Sam Harris. Um, I, I'm sure you can attest to that. Are there are there that many people who've really researched the phenomenon who come to the conclusion that you know all these dismissive any of these dismissive conclusions it's hypoxia it's it's an illusion it's you know whatever uh, uh, is is that the case I don't think so is it yeah no that's that's not on the table and as you and I are are kind of alluding to here you know the next level of this is to one really hone in on what the topic is because the topic is really about consciousness yes. and survival is just the uh, survival of consciousness is really just the ultimate test. It's the one ultimate test, right? Thing. Because we right. can bat around, you know, the observer effect and all this other stuff. Yeah. But when you can say, hey, man, that dude died and he was <laughs> in a body bag and right. yet he was able to observe what was going on and report it in detail in a way that 
we have other eyewitnesses that say that. Well, how would you know that? How would that? So we get from a near-death experience standpoint, we get there. But as a lot of other people have pointed out, you get there a number of other ways. You yes. can go to the University of Virginia and get all that reincarnation research. And it's right. just, you know, you, you yeah. can't you can't just sidestep. It. Well, you can sidestep it. But ultimately, the reason why science can't swallow this is because as it relates to consciousness and the position they've taken, and this will be a little bit of a trip down memory lane, but this is kind of fun for me to remind folks what's really behind the Sam Harris kind of mindset. And now it's really kind of this limited hangout kind of thing in a way when he talks about, you know, he's saying meaning of life and meditation and, you yeah, know, know, what are you really, and all this stuff. Hey, bro, from a science standpoint, it comes down to one thing. It comes down to consciousness. Yeah. Okay, let me play this clip. But you can say something about the question which you really would wish to know the answer to. And I mean, for, for me, it would be what, what's consciousness? Oh, that's well, Dawkins, that's of course. That's yeah. Totally baffling. Scott, Richie, you know what I think? I agree. Not oh, that you me. ask, but what I think on this is uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue about what consciousness is is drawn from the, in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books not really on like Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. <laughs> so, so what I wonder, what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. And that, of course, is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, that was a rogues gallery. I'm laughing like, you're like rolling. I was laughing. What is so funny about that? Of course, that last voice was Bill Nye. The science guy who was up there with him too. What's he was astonished. <laughs> Bill was astonished. <laughs> it doesn't take much. <laughs> I mean, the idea that maybe consciousness is not there is probably the weirdest, stupidest idea ever conceived by human thought. I mean, where does thought take place? It takes place in consciousness. So here we have consciousness uh, uh, speculating about the possibility that consciousness does not exist and it may not be there. I mean, the very thought is, is an in-your-face contradiction. And the fact that something like this is not only seriously entertained, but even verbalized by a person with the public exposure of the gentleman we just saw is, is uh, uh, a worrying sign of cultural sickness. Okay, so that first quote, or that first clip was obviously uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the second was me yucking it up with uh, Dr. Bernardo Castro about just how absurd that is. And I think he does a great job of it, so I don't need to go over it again. But I juxtapose that with Sam Harris's clip, because Sam Harris is saying the exact same thing. He's just putting it in a different wrapper. He's saying, well, consciousness can really only be tied to the brain. So therefore, there's no way we could even imagine philosophy, 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 that consciousness could survive bodily death. Enter in our friend, Dr. Alexander in Brazil, who says, hey, uh, well, I I'm sorry, I just reviewed the best evidence we have, and it completely <laughs> contradicts what you're saying by every means we have of evaluating it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you think of that? That little Absolutely. And I, I, like I said, I love that rogues gallery of you've got the Lawrence Krauss and Sam Harris and Bill Nye, the science guy, was great. And you had um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And, um, and, and I love... You know, Kastrop's response to that, he, he's hes never at a loss for um, an acerbic response to nonsense. But um, 
Well, it I, is, it, in nonsense is the key word because yeah. uh, what Bernardo is saying here, which is difficult for people to hear, because I know, you know, I run into this all the time and kind of the don't suffer fools gladly kind of thing. But mm -hmm. it's like, this is how, you know, you're an academic, you're an intellectual, you're a scholar. This is how you guys talk. It is, it's not a blood sport, but it's like, hey, we got to get to the truth. So we don't, you know, we just kind of put it out there and say, that's silly. It's nonsense. No, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm kind of as flummoxed as you. And I'm I'm constantly, I'm even writing, you know, some scholar, you know, my own scholarly papers and, and looking at the, the research and um, and reading the scholarship all the time. I just don't get it. I, I think to some extent, you know, I think people like Rupert Sheldrake, you know, as a longtime fan here, a longtime guest here, has, has pointed this out to you that to some extent, the scientific community has loosened its death grip desperate death grip on materialism, correct? I mean, and now even a Sam Harris, I think, um, is starting to talk about things like panpsychism and, and all these escape routes they have where they can try to still be physicalists, but pretend they're not, right? And and uh, open the door just enough to let some other stuff in um, so that they, they, do, they don't sound completely ridiculous. But... Um, I, I just don't know. I read this stuff and I, and this is why I guess I've lingered on this topic so long and haven't gone your route, the sort of the Skeptico 2.0 route and just said, listen, we've got this question settled now. Any reasonable person can look over the evidence for themselves. Let's see where it leads us. Let's get beyond the debate over whether there's such a thing as consciousness and all this ridiculous stuff. Um I keep going back to it because everybody and people in my field are still insisting, no matter what arguments you come up with, no matter how you critique their arguments, they're still insisting the kind of things you're hearing from Sam Harris in that video. You, you yeah. said something really interesting there, Rich, that I think we should jump onto next. And that is the loosening of the grip of uh, materialism. Although I would say, I don't think it's a loosening of the grip as much as it is kind of re-aiming at the target of retargeting in a different way. And I think the next article that you sent me is a perfect example of that. So tell folks about this article that you sent me. Yeah, it's a great article. I like it. It's written for the public in Aeon Magazine by some leading public intellectual kind of scientific figures and uh, who are both physicists. And then a couple of them have been guests on the show, I think at least, right? Is Evan Tom? Thompson or Thomas, what's his name? Evan Thompson, one yes. of them. Yeah, and uh, he's a psych. You know, he's a psychologist who. Yeah, Marcelo Gleiser, Adam Frank are two really popular physicists right now. And I mean by popular, I mean in the in the popular culture right now. You hear a lot about hear a lot from them, and Evan Thompson certainly is as a psychologist. Um, I just, you know, again, the the, the, the article uh, talks about the need. To for science again to expand its purview from simply looking at reality from a third person lens to more at least of a first person lens they have no idea how to do that but they want to they they want to say that as scientists when we're talking about reality in general we can no longer in only validate a third person perspective abstract scientific perspective on reality we need to admit that there's such a thing as a first person perspective. And yet all three of those guys, and I'm not really sure about Evan Thompson, but I think all three of those guys are, are pretty much, they're physicalists. I, I would consider them physicalists. And I have no idea how you would reconcile those two, those two parameters. I think that the, just to add one more thing, I think the, the, the contemporary physicalists, who are being the most honest and and putting forth the best argument now that they can come up with are the Olymp the guys that are called the limited eliminativists or illusionists sometimes they they call themselves um who just sort of bite the bullet and they say consciousness is an illusion i don't know how that works either but that's another new argument that's sort of doubling down on the traditional materialist argument the other the other strategy is to do what these three guys have done and say, well, 
we also, we're not really, we don't believe in scientism anymore. We believe in naturalism. So we admit that people have things like lived experience and you can find meaning in life, even though life really is meaningless because all it is is a bunch of physical forces and abstract quantities in motion. But but we like that. So I, that's the strategy. I think that's the significance of that article as far as I'm concerned. I would agree. So what they're trying to do is to, like they've done a million times before with other things, they're, they're, they're trying to have it both ways, right? So from a philosophical standpoint, they're trying to reach down and embrace you and say, we got you. And yeah. then from a scientific standpoint, they're saying, hey, there's this new thing out there called yeah. experience. Yeah. <laughs> Newsflash. <laughs> there is such a thing as human experience. Yeah. But then they're careful in the article to say, as you just said, to walk the line and say, hey, this doesn't mean I'm down with anything supernatural or anything outside right. of physics, right. which, of course, is complete nonsense, because the problem with consciousness, the problem with consciousness is not an illusion, which is obvious. Yeah. and is proven by consciousness surviving death, is yeah. that it does mean that science is fundamentally incomplete in its understanding. So when you, you science can no longer talk about things like supernatural, there's the, the, the whole meaning of science is that we can measure things in this natural world. And now you're starting. So as soon as you start talking about things outside the natural world, yeah. you're, you put super on it, or you can put some <laughs> extra other term on it, but yeah. you're outside of, of that range. Do you see the same contradiction I do in this idea of lived experience if consciousness is ultimately an illusion yeah i mean i i you know sean carroll is writing books about the meaning of life he's a complete materialist right i think you had him on the show about it right and um you know sam harris is 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 a guru now right i mean he's a pop culture sort of guru but people come to him with answers about the meaning of life and what, what is it and, and and to me i i if you're a physicalist, one of the main thing, I mean, you, 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 you can't really acknowledge morality. You can't really acknowledge aesthetic quality. You can't really acknowledge literature art. You can't acknowledge the meaning of life if there is such a thing. Now, they, they don't think there's, I mean, it's ruled out in advance. From your perspective, as a guy, philosophy, cultural history, why is that obvious to you and I? But they've obscured it in terms of they make it sound like, well, what do you mean, Rich? No, of course you can. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, your, your guess is as good as mine because you've interrogated these guys on the same thing, right? The apostles of or the established religion of scientism and physicalism have said it best themselves, right? Daw Richard Dawkins says that, uh, that we're biological robots. Robots don't have any sense of meaning. They don't have any consciousness. They don't have any sense of morality. They don't choose. They don't have free will. He also said that the world, as we see it, is not only pointless, but it's um, everything that you would expect if his reductive concept, con uh, conception of evolution is true. Purposeless, pitiless, cold, indifferent, cruel, which again, I suppose the cruel part isn't a word that he could really admit because you can't even have you can't even have good or evil, as you've pointed out, in a realm without consciousness or meaning. So I have no idea. I think that's what that means. I think again, and the great the great gift that science has given us is to be is to allow people who want to approach questions about experience in that reductive, abstract way mechanistic way that science allows you to to proceed to look at questions and only look at them through that narrow lens but and and that narrow lens al allows you by virtue of its reductive simplistic abstract nature to control and manipulate the world and the environment in very effective ways that you can't if you admit all these other things into the picture, but that's the, the scientific picture necessitates. If it's a physicalist one that you, you rule out in advance, anything associated with consciousness. And you know, the way I always put it is science requires our ability to measure, right? That's it. 
And if we're going to say that consciousness is this other player in this game, but we can't really wrap our arms around it, like yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson was fumbling <laughs> to say, then we're we're saying that everything we do over here, we can't really measure because there's an asterisk by all our measurements that says we couldn't really account for consciousness. We yeah. know it's out there, but we couldn't really account for it. And that's yeah. really uncomfortable. And so I, I think what's really kind of cool, but I, I love how you brought this to the table for this discussion is this idea of how they're now trying to sneak in this lived experience. So when yeah. you see somebody say lived experience, know that what they're really saying is you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe. And I'm going to condescendingly pat you on the head and say, you have the illusion of having some form of experience, but I'm not really acknowledging that. Do you think, man, let me ask you, because this is something we talked about prior to in anticipation of this um, this talk, and maybe I'm getting ahead of where you wanted to go with it anyway, but do you think that those guys, you know, who are, who are again, they're, they're such important public intellectuals, they influence millions of people, they speak for the ethos of our intellectual and popular culture, do you think those guys, meaning the Dawkins and the Sam Harris's and the Sean Carroll's, do you think that they are actually secretly, they're so cynical that they're smarter than what they're actually saying? Or do you think they really believe in some kind of convoluted way that you can have a meaningless universe, but also have meaning at the same time? This is the question I've really wrestled with for a long time. And I think I've loved it for the longest time for years because I really didn't believe in my heart of hearts that someone could wrap their head around it. I thought they were, I thought they were front, man. I thought they were playing and I don't think that anymore. And I, I think it boils down to three things. And I think they're really important to differentiate. The first is just a personal, you know what I mean? Mm. We have, per, yeah. we all have personal beliefs that we've built up because they make us feel comfortable they make us feel like who we are. They make us feel like we understand the world at least a little bit where we can kind of function in it. And when someone comes along and wants to change that, the reaction is really strange in some ways. You know, this is the, the religious kind of thing and the yeah. fundamentalist kind of thing. It's sure. a cultish thing, but it's also just the kind of every day I get up and I eat the same breakfast and I go to the gym at the same time. And it's, I want to feel comfortable. I get it. I'm there. But when that comes into your job as a scientist or philosopher, you get what you get, which is what we see. The second element of it, I think, is professional. You know what I mean? You can't talk. Uh, we, we know this, you know, all the skeptical shows I've done where somebody says, hey, man, it was my job. And, the, you know, my boss mm -hmm. said, the head mm -hmm. of the department said, you yeah. publish that again, you can find someplace else to yeah. go hang your shingle and work as a professor, <laughs> which isn't easy, right? So you just learn to kind of get along and what's yeah. the most important thing. But the third one, and this is my frustration with so many of the people I talk to in our community and the community we're familiar with, is the deception. There yeah. are people who it is their job to obscure to confuse, to yeah. mislead, if you will. They don't even have to mislead. All they have to do is confuse, to keep the momentum going. Like we've seen, you know, you talk about the near-death experience. When that thing first hit, you know, I was talking about the Evan Alexander thing. And all of a sudden, the pushback was immediate and came from all these angles and it was on the front of the magazines and all this, and he was debunked. All organized, systematic. There is something behind mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. when I talk to you know, near-death experience researchers who are at universities and say, do you see that? And they kind of chuckle and they kind of sneer and they kind of condescendingly go, well, well, no, I mean, there isn't any real deception. Well, of course there is. All you have to do is you have to look other places. And that's where I thought, you know, at the beginning, I said, you look at what happened in the last year and, and how they claimed made all these false claims about science that have now been proven false. And they claim that they were science. That is how the game is played on as it was revealed to us to think that that game to some extent, isn't being played over here on the consciousness thing, I think mm -hmm. is just naive. What do you think? Yeah. I, 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 
I let me ask you this because I get you. And and in the last few interviews, I'd say of the last six or seven interviews, shows you've done on Skeptico, I think have really, with a few people in particular, have really, I thought, addressed that and drawn a lot of these disparate areas where you where you recognize this going on together. I thought, I don't know if you agree, but I, I thought they were particularly good. Um, made me think a lot about um about this. I I just <laughs> I, I look around and I think even with, say, the science recently about a lot of these recent issues that you, you've addressed on Skeptico um, and you see that, you know, the, you know, the, yeah, really right within the, the space of a year, the, the, these, these claims are made and then shown to be ridiculous or you're just wrong or inconsistent. Are the reason that the people who are making them, even the, even in the, even in those situations, not even about consciousness, are those people just doing that because they're supposed to sound authoritative and they're and they and they're supposed to sound like they like they know what they're talking about and they're pretty sure and they're all kinds of political forces sort of forcing them and pressuring them to maybe sound more sure of their theories than they are, or? Is it even more diabolical than that? That's what I'm wondering. Is is it that, or does it depend on the field? I don't know. Or um, does it? Are do they really? Are they being deceptive because they just want to be deceptive for evil purposes, for lack of a better word? Well, you know, it's interesting because I I, I, th- I was with you right there until the end, and then I think it gets tricky because I, I really appreciate that you saw that in those shows because I think when you step outside of our little world here, which is the which is the real game, the game that you and I are playing, does consciousness survive death is the game because it's ultimately, who are you? Why are you here? It's the most fundamental questions we can ask. And to get pulled into, you know, all this other stuff of current events or you know, the UFO stuff or, you know, anything about the health crisis that went yeah, on, you know, right. is really to kind of miss the point. Cause what you really want to know is, is there more to me? And then I can start dealing with, you know, what is my relationship to that greater? And I think as we're saying, you can only do that if you step over that line to get into consciousness. But the good thing about going in those other areas is it kind of reveals some things that we can know about the deceptive element. And there's two things I think at play. One is there are people who can be convinced along that professional line that mm. it is in everyone's best interest for them to be deceptive mm. and come on, we all kind of play the game and, you know, you didn't tell the car dealer this or, you know, whatever the, yeah. when I filled out my mortgage application, of course I didn't exactly, yeah. you know, do this and that. We all know there's a gray area. So if I'm going to play that gray area, am I really that different from, from anyone else? There's mm-hmm. that. And I think that can be really, really confusing to us who are trying to figure out who is Sam Harris? Is he real? Is Neil deGrasse Tyson? Mm -hmm. Is he real or is he a psyop? Because the (laughs) second part of it is the people who that is their job. So, you know, the Michael Wallach interview I did, Bob, you go and you come out of it, you go, wait a minute, maybe that is this guy's job. He is a Mm -hmm. professional because we know we have, we know we have more of them than an ever any time in history, people whose job it is to control the narrative, to be part of the social engineering project. So right. uh, again, I think the hard thing for people in our field to grasp is to even consider that that might be at play. And when I bring it up to folks and they go, oh, they snicker, they sneer, they oh my God, that couldn't be in play in reincarnation research, in near-death experience research. Yeah naive of course yeah. it's a big it's a big game yeah I, I i i'm i'm with you there even though and i can see why people like the 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 large majority of scholars who are just you know putting their nose to the grindstone and you know only thinking in terms in the in the academic bubble that they're working in um where you you know you learn the lingo and you understand how ideas are expressed and you have this general sort of paradigm you know you're working within in terms of where you go with your ink where you can and can't go with your inquiry and stuff i can see how the large majority of those people who i guess are the ones who who um are 
I guess those are the the people who we're talking about. I mean, the average college professor who never, you know, becomes famous, but he's teaching tons of thousands of students, right, all the time and influencing them in, in terms of things like consciousness. Um, I can see why they would never even really think about maybe even question the, the received wisdom that consciousness is physical somehow and never really think outside that box or challenge it seriously. So they'd never even get to the point where they're saying, well, why would anybody, why wouldn't, why would anybody who knows this is must, who must know this is ridiculous lie about it? Um, I, I just think, you know, most people are just oblivious. They're, I guess it's like, you know, the levels of, um, of recovery from substance abuse. The first thing to know is how ignorant, you know, how bad you're, how bad off you are. And, and people who are really bad at the lowest level don't even know they have a problem yet. And I get the impression that for the large majority of people in our intellectual and popular culture, they don't even know there's a problem. And I guess you would say that is largely because the people who do know there's a problem don't want them to know there's a problem and feed them crap and keep them distracted and and keep them scared if that's necessary. Is that what sort of where you, where the Alex Securis um, sort of worldview on that? It, it, it more or is less. Centered? More or less. I mean, I do think it's interesting. We didn't play a lot of the clip, but to listen to Joe Rogan, who I think is tremendous yeah. on a lot of things, yeah. but limited hangout, man. Yeah. Limited hangout. You're listening yeah. to Sam Harris, Lex Friedman. Yeah. Love yes. Lex Friedman. I'm all over yeah. the AI stuff. Limited hangout. Yeah. Listen to what these guys take Sam Harris as an example. We could have five other people that would fit the bill, including yeah. the people you mentioned, Sean Carroll, Neil Grass Tyson, yeah. uh, more, more current people, but it's yeah. always the message never gets to this point. It, the discussion yeah. never reaches right. uh, this level in terms of how this is a socially engineered how this might be, how this yeah. might be socially engineered, why it would have certain advantages. What would be the advantages to doing it a certain way? Right. And, and, and I agree. And, and you know, the, it's obvious why it seems to me, it's obvious why it would be great if you wanted to have a population that was easy to, to, to control and to exploit in various ways to have that myth be the one you perpetuate as, as your, as your, you know, your social ethos. And then, I, and again, for me, because for me, you know, I've been indoctrinated by your, your show for long enough that, that I'm, 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 I'm where, you know, where your, your show is heading in terms of, I got that. I mean, I think that's it's pretty obvious that it's obvious that there, you know, there's, Probably a, in some sense, and I, and I don't know how a, del, a deliberate effort to keep people dumb um, so that they can be exploited easily. I mean, it's pretty obvious in a lot of ways. But then, why why do they? Who wants to do that? And why is yet another level, right? Who it is, is it, it that wants to do this, keeping people dumb? I mean, who could you put your finger on and say a handful of corporate CEOs and political figures? And then beyond them, why are they that way? Is there so who's controlling what they think? I think that's a great question. And I think it's a question that also derails the whole conversation in a yeah. way that is, they, I don't know that they want it to be derailed, but it is a natural part of the thing. Because I think the answer to that comes in a clip and I'll try and find the clip and paste it in, but I don't have it at my fingertips. It's from a ex-CIA guy. And there is no such thing as ex-CIA guys. <laughs> but nonetheless, he, he points out what I've always kind of known, and he reveals it. And he says, it's about uh, confusion mm. that ultimately the, the whole world is so complex and the social engineering project is so impossible that the best we can hope for in our operations is confusion. Mm. And confusion is a good thing because mm. if I control the signal, and I have a bunch of noise that I can introduce, and but I can still get my signal through, then I've kind of accomplished because I blocked the other signals that can get mm. through. So yeah. confusion, confusion is a good thing. Get people on their heels, get yeah. people thinking atheism, get people thinking then occultism and satanic stuff, and get people thinking lived experience, but 
there really isn't any real ex lived experience because conscious divide and rule and confusion is your friend yeah. in, in that process. Are people though, who are perpetuating the say, I'll just take the, you know, in my, in my area that, that I work in the people who are perpetuating, you know, the, the physicalism about consciousness uh, narrative. I mean, is there any way to trace them to some larger, you know, their thought and their influence to some larger forces at work? I don't think so, because I think we have to start with that, that almost like that pyramid that we talked about. And at the base of the pyramid is I don't want to change my beliefs to whatever extent my life is livable. <laughs> I won't even yeah. say great to whatever yeah. extent it's livable. It rests yeah. on the fact that I'm constantly seeking to be soothed, to be comforted by yeah. that voice inside my head, manipulated mm -hmm. in a way that makes me feel okay. Okay. And the last thing I want to do is take that leap and say, there's something more because beyond this whole discussion we're having about biological robots and a meaningless universe is some of that Sam Harris stuff that he's repurposed in a way, but like, what is that voice inside your head and why are you listening to it? And what does it do? And is there an ultimate voice beyond that voice? All these are spiritual questions. The barrier to those spiritual questions is the voice is purely a product of your brain, right? That's a stop. That's a full yeah. stop. But yeah. beyond that, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of roadblocks that I don't want to cross. You don't want to cross in terms of understanding who we really are. How does that, how does that hit you in terms of, you know, your lived experience? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That uh, no makes, makes a great deal of sense. I, I, you know, I, I looked up some uh, statistics on, on it's just interesting to me that um, with respect to beliefs in consciousness, popular beliefs in consciousness versus beliefs in the academy, and there's almost a uh, diametrically opposed difference between the willingness to accept ideas like extended consciousness in the general public versus in the academy so um it's interesting if, you, if you're gonna if you're gonna be able to participate in the um in the high priesthood you really have to it seems to be me you really have to buy the party line that it's uh that it's promulgating because it's about three quarters or, or even more of the general public tend to be very open to what all these He's, you know, they're called paranormal, right? Um, or parapsychological phenomenon and, and dimensions of experience. Um, the very fact that they're anything like that is para anything is kind of ridiculous, right? Um, but but uh, among the general public, there's the 75, 80% um, openness to understand to, 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 to the, the reality of those of those uh, experiences and that there's some th something generally substantive behind them. Whereas in the Academy, it's just the opposite, even religious beliefs, openness to, to religious belief. It's, I think, I don't know, something like 75% of people in roughly uh, philosophers are atheists, professional philosophers, and something like 75 to 80% of the general public are, in some sense, religious. Hey, Rich, before I, I let you go, tell me about this project that you're working on. Yeah, Infinite Discoveries uh, uh, is our, a website uh, that put together really by colleagues that, that drew me into the project that is a, a, a difficult to define. You can, I, I invite you to visit the site at infinitediscoveries.org. There, there are um, Blogs by by ourselves, and now we're beginning to ask some of our contributors and our speakers because we also have a YouTube uh, a YouTube channel that's associated with the with the site, and we talk about current events, uh, philo but philosophy, history, uh, the social and behavioral uh, sciences, um, art, humanities, with leading kind of like skeptical with leading thinkers and their critics. And we consider those things on the, on that, uh, that site. Um, so feel free to investigate that, that uh, at, again, infinite discoveries.org. If you're interested in some, I don't know, cutting edge thinking and research that we're doing and that other people are doing on world affairs and the human condition, 
I guess that's that that's what the project is really all about. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad you, uh, you you reached out to me. It's always great to talk to you. I think we have such a cool connection. I appreciate that. You know, we, we've kind of connected on the show a number of times in some ways. I'm always encouraging people to do like what you did is to kind of reach out and say, hey, you know, I like this and I want to be more involved. I'm going to go interview. You did even further. I just say, I tell people, set up an interview with someone you want and we'll do it. You yeah. took it one step further and actually did a couple of interviews <laughs> for us. And they were great. They're really good. I think there's a lot of people out there that have the ability if they're willing to put themselves out there. As Definitely. Uh, yeah. A lot of your skeptical viewers, I'd love to hear them corral some people in, uh, <laughs> into an interview for you or, or, or even inquire themselves. I agree. Okay. Well, Rich, thanks again. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thanks again to Dr. Richard Grego for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up is, in light of everything that's going on, and if I have to break that down for you, how are we to understand folks in prominent positions who hold on to the biological robot meaningless universe meme? Is it as simple as self-soothing? Could that be the answer? As always, let me know your thoughts. Let me hear from you. Engage. I'm here. I'm not too busy. I want to talk to you. <laughs> Take care. Bye for now.